Let us pray. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants, for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established a Paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who would believe what we have heard, and to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground, without beauty, without majesty. We saw him. No looks to attract our eyes. A thing despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. A man to make people scream their faces. He was despised, and we took no account of him. And yet, ours were the suffering he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God, and brought low. Yet, he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace. And through his wounds, we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth like a lamb that is led 
to the slaughterhouse like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead to his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his hairs. He shall have a long life. And through him, what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over. He shall see the light and be content. By his suffering shall my servant justify many, taking their faults on himself. Hence, I will grant the whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learned to obey through suffering, but having been made perfect, he became for all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there and he went into it with his disciples. Judas the traitor knew the place well since Jesus had often met his disciples there and he brought the cohort to his place together with a detachment of God sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons, knowing everything that was going to happen to him. Jesus then came forward and said, And they answered, He said, Now Judas the traitor was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time. And they said, Jesus replied,
This was to fulfill the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, The cohort and its captain and the Jew, Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They first took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter with another disciple followed Jesus. This disciple who was known to the high priest went with Jesus into the high priest's palace, but Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, And he answered, Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret, but why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the gods standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way of the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offense in it, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, He denied it, saying, One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Again, Peter denied it, and at once a cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the Praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, Pilate said, Take him yourselves and try him by your own law. The Jews are. 
answered, We are not about to put a man to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord? Or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own priest and people who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent my being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. Pilate said, So you are a king then? Jesus replied, it is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth, listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth. What is that? And with that he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged, and after this the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I'm going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no kids. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priest and the guard shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, We have a Pilate heard him say this, his, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have power to Jesus 
Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free, but the Jew shouted, If you set him free, you are the of Caesar, and the one who makes himself king is the Caesar. Hearing these words, Jesus had Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement in Hebrew Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day. About the sixth hour, Pilate said to the Jews, They said, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king except So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Then they took charge of Jesus, and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it was in called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city, and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the Jewish priest said to Pilate, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each shoulder. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, Instead of having it, let's go by to decide who is to have it. In this way the words of Scripture were fulfilled. They shed out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near, Jesus said to his mother, Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. 
After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed, and to fulfill the scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there, so putting a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. And so instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth. And he gives it so that you may believe as well because all this happened to fulfill the words of scripture, not one bone of his will be broken. And again in another place, scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have peace. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night time, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus, and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there.
Dear brothers and sisters, the passion narrative that we have just listened to is so sad and so tragic that the phrase Good Friday seems like a cruel hoax and a misnomer. How can it be good when the worst of human nature was on display? There was the fickleness of the crowds who acclaimed Hosanna to the King one day and shouted, crucify him, crucify him, the next. There was a betrayal, denial, and cowardice of the disciples. His enemies succeeded in their conspiracy and false accusations against him. His final cry on the cross sums it up all. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Dream was turned into nightmare and hope into disillusionment for Jesus and for those like him who place their trust in God, at least apparently. But the crucifixion was not what it appeared to be. It was not a colossal failure and an unmitigated disaster. For despite all appearances to the contrary, Good Friday gives us a glimpse into the depths of God's love. Paradoxically, it was through the cross that the greatest love was revealed. It was not evil that had the upper hand. Rather, it was God's unflinching fidelity his unconditional love for the world in Jesus that brought about this triumph. With the eye of faith, we can recognize the true meaning of Good Friday. For this was the hour of glory that Jesus had spoken about. This was the climax to the life of a humble Messiah who came to serve and not to be served the prophet who resisted all forms of evil, the supreme high priest who made himself completely like us in our weaknesses and in our vulnerabilities. On this day, we come to venerate the cross because it is a symbol of God's love for us. It is not an act of appeasement of an angry God. Rather, it was an act of total self-giving. It was a love that gave itself away. A love that truly triumphed against all odds. So even though the passion story ends with tragedy, Jesus shows us that suffering and death, born for the sake of others, have transformative power. Indeed, they lead to new levels of being, living and relating. They enable us to enter into communion with the God of love, to expand the boundaries of life, even in the here and now. Jesus' death on the cross is truly the expression of the wisdom of God. God breaks the grip of scapegoating by stepping into the place of a victim God is willing to die for us, to bear our sin, because we desperately need deliverance from our propensity to violence, scapegoating, and victim blaming. Through Jesus' self-sacrifice, God has reset the cycle of human behavior. It has enabled us to build a new future, even with the people whom we regard as threats, as outsiders, or as enemies. The work of the cross is the work of the transcendent God breaking into a cycle we could not change alone. To believe in the crucified one is to want no other victims. To depend on the blood of Jesus is to refuse to depend on the blood of anyone else, or to make an enemy out of the other. It is ref to refuse to play the mob 
that makes a scapegoat out of the victim who may be the weak, the marginalized, and the minority among us. So dear friends, as we gather on this solemn day, we're challenged to follow the example of Christ even at the cost of our own comfort, privilege, and power. Jesus did not follow the script of the empire. He came as a poor, humble servant in order to minister at the thresholds of human vulnerability. He exposed the status quo as being short of God's vision for human society. We therefore must examine our own attitudes and the conventions of the day in relation to the treatment of the poor of our time in order to see if it too falls short of God's vision for us. Today we do not simply come to grieve for what, had, what happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago. For he continues to suffer in his brothers and sisters. He suffers with the people of Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, and other conflict areas, particularly the dire situation in Gaza as we speak. We must recognize him and serve him disguised in the asylum seekers, refugees of our world. We must grieve with our indigenous peoples whose plight betrays our own sense of a fair goal. We must have the courage to address our own complicity in perpetuating systemic injustices against people who are scapegoated as a threat and are subject to harsh, inhumane, and unfair processes and legislations. As Christians, we are called to recognize the face of Christ in the least of our brothers and sisters. Good Friday gives rise to Easter Sunday. Despite the menacing power of sin and darkness around us, God's yes in Jesus triumphs, and it triumphs for all eternity. So may we have the courage to be our best, even in the worst possible scenarios, following the God of reversals and surprises, one whose love nothing can destroy. May our discipleship and witness to his self-giving love be brought to fruition in accordance with God's vision of the fullness of life for all humanity. Let us stand. Let us pray for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Mm -hmm. 
Almighty, ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy, that your church, spread throughout the world, may persevere with steadfast faith in the confessing of your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. <laughs> Almighty, ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our Bishop Vincent, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your, minist your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may, serve, all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts, and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us kneel. Let us stand. <laughs> Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together 
and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. <laughs> Almighty ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who bestow your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for people in all war zones of the world for those who have fled the dread of violence and have been deprived of their homes, for all women and men who stand up with their lives to ward off evil and to protect the weak and the persecuted. Let us kneel. Let us stand. <laughs> Almighty and eternal God, you have compassion for the lowly and the poor, but you throw down the oppressors. As you guided Israel out of slavery in Egypt, so save in our days all victims of war and violence, 
Change the hearts of evildoers and let peace be victorious through Christ our Lord. Amen. We now have the uh, collection for the Holy Land, and this year in addition to the need to maintain the holy places, some of which have been destroyed by war and violence, there's also a need to um, make a uh, humanitarian response to the victims of war, especially the, the minority Christian people there. So the Pope has asked of us to be generous in our solidarity and communion with our uh, fellow Christians in the Holy Land, but also to the many victims of, of, the, uh, of the war. Thank you. Please stand.
at the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Bow down for a blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comforts be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. That's it.